morning. Well, for those of you who like spoken word a little better than, um, than just reading, I decided to record this. So this is going to make uh, it into several segments. So this is the first one. We're discussing what center of mass is. Now, for us, we're interested in center of mass in the context of conservation and momentum. The key idea here is that center of mass does not change because of a collision or explosion. That is, the motion of the center of mass does not change. However, the center of mass is moving before the collision, it will continue to move after the collision. So, the real question is, well, how are we going to find the center of mass? So, that's the first question. The latter is, of course, how do we apply it in our momentum problems? So, but how do we find a center of mass? Well, in practice, we're going to end up doing this very much like we did the first year. We're going to take the position of a chunk of mass, multiply it by that mass, the position of the next chunk of mass, multiply it by another mass, add them all up, divide by the total mass of the system. And so our center of mass can be expressed as follows. 1 over the total mass times the sum of the position of the individual masses times their individual mass. So let's look at a first year example and see how we'd actually apply this and, and where this expression comes from. So how far to the right of point A is the center of mass of this uniform density and depth object? Why uniform density and depth? Well, I want each one of these rect well squares on the screen to count for one mass unit. I'm going to call each of these blocks to be a single mass unit. And just like I'm going to call each of these sides a single length unit. So the first thing we need to do is, is break this up. Now, there's plenty of ways to break this up. I could break this up into eight individual boxes. In general, we would like to break it up into larger shapes that we easily know the center of mass of. So I've decided to break it up in this example into a chunk with these three blocks and these five blocks grouped together. So if we consider the weight of each of these sections, we'll get 3G and 5G respectively. Now, what's going to balance them? Well, we need an, we need a, both of these forces relative to point A rotate this, would tend to rotate this object in a clockwise direction. In order to balance them, we'll need a force upward and to the right of point A to give us a counterclockwise force. So I'm saying what if we do this with a support force, so a normal force. We could also do this with a cord hanging down from the top as well. So let's put a normal force up from the bottom. And this will give us something to talk about later as well. Now, each of these forces is a different horizontal distance over from point A. The 5G is a distance x1, the 3D is a just 3G is a distance x2, and the normal force is the disposition of the center of mass away. So we would need to put that normal force under the center of mass in order to support this object. Why do I only care about a horizontal distance? Well, fundamentally, this is a torque problem. This is the clockwise torques from the 5G and the 3G forces are balanced by the counterclockwise torque of the normal force. So that would look like this. Now, one important thing that you probably have already said is, well, I've got upward forces and downward forces. And so this normal force is just the sum of the first mass times g and the second mass times g, so 5g plus 3g. So I'm writing it symbolically on the right here so that our original expression is apparent. Now let's substitute in. And we get uh, substitute in there for the normal force. So we get the total mass on the left and the individual masses on the right, and you might notice every single term has a G in it. So if we cross out those Gs and call M1 plus M2 big M, we get the expression 
that we started with. This is the expression, this is the standard expression for center of mass expressed kind of in algebraic first year terms. So let's get rid of that and then put up the numbers. So M1 being um, 5, M2 being 3, and our distance is, well, that distance is half a length unit because it's in the middle, and this distance is two and a half length units. And so we see this and find that the center mass is 1.25 length units. Well, wait, 1.25 length units is over here to the right of the um, bottom block. Well, what's that mean? Well, if I tied a rope up here 1.25 length units over, no problem, this block will hang. Oops. Um, however, if I, tie, if I have a support from below, I'm over here in no man's land. I can't actually apply an upward force on from, from along this face. I could apply it up here, but I would actually need to push on the, you know, a quarter of a meter over on that pink face, or the block falls over. Second year, let's look at the calculus version. So, you might have noticed that our initial version was effectively averaging uh, the position, the, that product of distance times mass. And so, averaging, you're going to say, uh, I'm going to have an integral here. And so, the calculus version of this is that the center of mass is 1 over the total mass times the integral of the position of the mass times the uh, individual infinitesimal mass. And so we'll add up these little dms. This is an expression that we've seen before. Um, and so we see it again here. Now, let's do a problem that we need the calculus version for. And I'm going to give you a simplification for this one, and then we'll see where it comes from in the second video. So let's consider a narrow triangular wedge. It's length L. It's got a little sliver of mass out of it, dm. Well, how much mass does dm have? I need dm in terms of dx. That sliver is thickness dx. How do I know? Well, let me give you a mass distribution along this wedge. And we'll treat this wedge as a rod because this is a very narrow wedge. We'll just treat it as a rod that's not uniform. It has very little mass towards the left end, more mass towards the right end. And so the expression we'll use for that is the linear mass density lambda is 2 times big M times X over L squared. So what's dm look like? dm is simply going to be the mass per unit length times the length of that little segment. And so dm is lambda dx. That gives us the expression that the center of mass is 1 over the mass of the rod times the integral over the rod of x times this term, which you'll recognize as lambda, times dx. So this is the dm, lambda dx. Now, what's the mass of the rod? Well, you're probably going to guess that the rest, mass of the rod is big M. But let's actually show that we can do that. So we'll add up the mass along the whole rod. Well, how do we do that? Well, we take an integral. The mass of the rod, we're just going to add up all the dms along the rod. So we're going to basically integrate lambda dx along the entire rod. And so that will look like this, completely worked out. And we see that the mass of the rod, as expected, is big M. So now let's turn back to our original integral for the center of mass and evaluate that. So what we'll do, what I've done here is I've written 1 over m times the integral of lambda x times lambda dx and pulled out all the constants in front. I haven't canceled anything out here. I've just pulled out this part of lambda into the front. And evaluating that, up x squared dx, not the hardest of integrals. Integrate, raise the power, divide by the new power, and we find x center of mass is 2 
over L squared, that's what was out in front, times X cubed over 3, evaluate at the endpoints. When we evaluate that, we find that the center of mass is two-thirds of the way along the bar. And that's the end of the first lesson on center of mass.